It's nobody's fault but ours, but the technology has made that happen. I'm glad you mentioned Snapchat because that's the one where you put something and then disappear. Mm -hmm. Right. So the only people who know about it are the people who own the technology, which means it never disappeared. You just can't get to it. <laughs> it, 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 it. It foisters a sense that you're not being surveilled, which of course increases your ability to be surveilled. <laughs> so, no, I would never be on Snapchat. Aww. Can you imagine the people who text naked pictures of themselves and think it's gone because they put it on Snapchat? <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bring it on, bring it on, bring it on. We'll wait till they get to the Supreme Court confirmation to unveil the mm -hmm. <laughs> But at any rate, but then that's not a person we want, or a Martin Delaney we want, which brings me to the point. We could have easily stopped or continued with uh, one of the finest memory keepers and historians anywhere in the world, uh, Larry Crow. Yes. Continue, yes. absolutely. <laughs> Don't say that lightly, brother. That's right. So like, you could have continued to give us a very thumbnail sketch of the life and work of Martin Delaney. Uh, but very shortly, we will visit the Delaney family, Martin and Catherine and three of their children. So I won't be here long. The, we stand here in this museum, and I did write said, I'm going to write because now we have a, something that uh, Baba Jake had instructed us to do long before I was in uh, ASCAC, joined through the African Center in Columbus, Ohio, which is write and publish. And so we have our journal, so uh, the ASCAC journal, the Compass, and we'll be publishing about Delaney. Larry's got a, another article to write. Uh, but when we were here in 1997, in this space. It's a remarkable moment because Martin Delaney is one of the towering figures in human history. And he is certainly in the first rank of thinkers in the last several centuries, the centuries of our oppression. And when we think about reading him now, it really comes down to reading him. And by that I mean it comes down to analyzing his words. That's very difficult with every subsequent generation. And so, just a few words. Anderson Thompson called Martin Delaney a man ahead of his time. When he called me by mistake the other day, so. <laughs> and I took the occasion, because I check in with him every month or so, but I said this time, I said, tell me what you would say to the people in Ohio when we are there in a couple of days about Martin Delaney. He said Martin Delaney was a man ahead of his time. And as usual with Anderson Thompson, it was perfect. Because he was. Any African seeking to track and weave a thread or threads of our identity is both behind and ahead of her time or his time. Every generation must make its own memory and discover its own meaning. Any individual who grants themselves or is appointed a memory keeper takes on a lonely living exercise. Building consensus among the living requires reliance on what other people know, what other people think, and what other people feel. In that respect, identity politics is best thought of as a given. Because when you're dealing with living people, you have to go on what they already know, what they want to know, and what they feel. But when you're dealing with reading and dealing with the past and dealing with visions of the future, you expand your scope. Everybody's not going to come to this sacred space. Everybody's not even going to spend the 10 or 15 minutes we got a chance to spend in this space. The memory keepers, the women and men who convene this space, they are charged with creating that narrative for us to inhabit which is a very lonely existence when you're dealing with the past and you're dealing with the future. For bringing to bear the weight of memory beyond one's own experiences, education and curiosity, is an exercise in perpetual choosing. At the level of groups, a selective remembering is much more powerful. The victims of powerful forgetting is a, are imposed upon with much higher stakes. So when we think about education, we're talking about imposed forgetting when it comes to oppressed people. 
An education system that is selective in what it allows us to remember mm -hmm. and very deliberate on what it requires us to forget. Yes. This man has been forgotten, not because we neglected him alone, but because he has been entered into a list of people who are required to be forgotten. Yes. And that's why he cannot be taught. Mm -hmm. That's why when he is taught, he's in a military uniform. Mm -hmm. And that's why when even uh, his, uh, his colleague Augusta, who was Dr. Augusta, who was buried at Arlington National Cemetery. You know, it's one of the things that we do, we go see our ancestors. Mm -hmm. We go see our ancestors in this land. So I go to Arlington a lot. I stood at the grave of Charles Young many times, that big block of granite with Young, looking down over the white generals like Walter Reed and others. Going to the grave of Dr. Augusta, who worked at Freedman's Hospital, then Howard University, who was also an appointed major after Delaney. But when Martin Delaney enters the narrative, he is only useful in the Civil War mm -hmm. and only useful as an American patriot. And what Larry Crow began to show us and what many of us know, many of you many times, many of you taught me when I first became aware of and began to study Martin Delaney, that can't be included. And that is the struggle that is going on even right now on the National Mall as while we're here, they're having a conference called the Future of the African American Past in Washington at the new Museum of African American History and Culture, which isn't open, but they have it at the Museum of the American Indian. And they're having a conversation on what should be included and what should be excluded. One of the leading scholars speaking there is a white man named Stephen Hahn. Why do I say white man? Not because he's white, but because his mentality is white. Mm -hmm. This is a man who won a major award for writing a book called A Nation Under Our Feet. And in that book, he starts by saying, I began by trying to investigate the Garvey movement. And I was in Philadelphia. He's at the University of Pennsylvania. He said, I walked into the Museum of African American History and Culture in Philly. Many people have been to that museum here. In fact, that has a tie. Because as Larry knows, in fact, Larry Crow's like John Henry Clark. He carries his books in his head. So I can ask you right quick, you do know who the first director of that museum was? Yes, you do. You know how I, you know, how I know you know? Because... He was also, at one time, the president of Wilberforce. That's exactly right. Charles Wesley. See, that's what I'm saying. It's always in his head. But the point is that Charles Wesley, running buddy with Carter Woodson, of course, the historian of many of the black organizations. Charles Wesley was the first director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Philadelphia, opened in 1976. Stephen Hahn went to that museum because there was a meeting of the UNIA, the local branch. Those of you in Philly know the UNIA is very strong in, in the East Coast, particularly in Philly. He went in because he thought it was a lecture on Marcus Garvey, not realizing that the UNIA continues to exist. He went in expecting a lecture on Garvey because he's a scholar on Garvey. Discovered that the UNIA still exists and it piqued his curiosity. Years later, his book was published, of course, and he is an expert. He's down on the National Mall while we're here discussing the future of the African American past. Mm -hmm. Again, the violence of forgetting. Mm -hmm. The violence of thinking that all these stories are about people who are dead and gone and have nothing to do with Barack Obama and mm -hmm. your future, which is Teach. continue to serve white people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And by that, I don't mean individual white people as much as I mean the white settler state known as the United States of America, that this man, Martin Delaney, fought against his whole life. Not the concept of America, but the idea that a settler state would be founded on the back of anyone oppressed. Yes. Where Jared Carter identifies the purpose of HBCUs, and take about five minutes, I'm going to sit down. The purpose of historically black colleges with producing community leadership as distinct from the purpose of many historically white colleges to produce a managerial class to continue this project, mm -hmm. particularly the elite ones who seek to replenish and connect that class to continue rulership and or restore and maintain it. He is laying bare the invisible tension woven into the fabric of the United States settler state. The tension articulated by Cedric Robinson is between those freedom dreams, like the ones of Martin Delaney, and those fueled with deeper memory to maintain this state. What does that mean? We are sitting here in between two of the oldest institutions after people created in this space. One, of course, in the case of Wilberforce, going back to that institution, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, that began in Philadelphia. It's no small accident that these things converge. 
didn't know before we came in this building that back there in that back corner would mm -hmm. be Brother Pinckney and Mother Emanuel, the Mother Church of African Methodism in the South. Mm -hmm. Linked, of course, to the right Reverend Richard Allen, Sarah Allen, and Morris Brown, who lie entombed in Philadelphia, the African Methodist Episcopals. And here we are next to Wilberforce, where Brother Delaney's friend Daniel Payne offered him and Catherine and the children refuge and a place to be, which is why they are buried in the cemetery with, Dr. Uh, with uh, Reverend Payne's wife, who is still buried there, even as Daniel Payne is buried in Baltimore. She having preceded him into ancestorhood. But these institutions are for different purposes than the non-African institutions. They are to create thinkers and leaders who are dedicated to elevating the race, which is why a few short feet from here, another man, a contemporary of Martin Delaney, who outlived Delaney and long enough to infect another young man with purpose, a man named Alexander Cromel, spoke on this campus. Yes. And Martin Delaney, the spirit of Delaney, along with the spirit of Cromel, both of whom visited Africa, Cromel, who spent almost two decades in Liberia, along with Edward Wilmot Blyden, coming back here and enlightening a young W.E.B. Du Bois, mm -hmm. who heard him speak right here on this land mm -hmm. at Wilberforce, and who writes about it in the souls of black folk, who himself visited Africa, who himself, with his arguments with Garvey notwithstanding, thought that we must think beyond the United States. Mm -hmm. These convergences speak to the importance of our institutions. The President of the United States was at Howard University a couple of weeks ago, and he gave a largely unremarkable speech where he cautioned the young people to balance passion with a plan. I say it was largely unremarkable because the President of the United States, who was wholly invested in the American settler state, seems to think that through sheer force of will and personality, he can steer this project into something other than what it is, is at its core. And advice he gives to young black people is not advice I caution young black people to listen to very carefully in terms of trying to follow, but to listen very carefully in terms of the clues he leaves as to his dream for them. Martin Delaney had passion, it's very clear, and Martin Delaney had a plan. To separate those two between a wall and to consign one to movement philosophy and the other to the enlightened philosophy of a structure like the United States is utterly absurd on its face. And all I could think of at that moment, knowing that I would be here shortly, was what would Martin Delaney say? Mm, mm, mm. But we know what Martin Delaney would say because Martin Delaney challenged the sitting president of the United States. Mm -hmm. Martin Delaney went to Abraham Lincoln and said, look, give us guns and we'll end this war. Mm -hmm. In fact, when you read some of the literature, Larry and I were talking about this uh, yesterday and today, Frederick Douglass was very disappointed that he didn't get that military commission. Well, some of the scholars think that part of the reason that Lincoln gave it to Delaney and not Douglass was because Delaney did not go into the meeting with Lincoln begging for anything. Mm -hmm. Delaney, in fact, wanted what Lincoln wanted, freedom for black people for himself and leave us alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas Douglas wanted to be part of the settler state. And Douglas thought the settler state could be something different. In other words, Lincoln knew that Douglas wanted to be free, but Lincoln may have said, yeah, but this guy Delaney is gonna make sure we're free if he kills me to get there. So therefore, give him the gun because we need to win this war. Why is that important? It's important as I draw to a conclusion today because in an age of illiteracy, our young people in particular, are not encouraged to read those words, Listen. to sit quietly and think. We're going to leave here in a few minutes, and we're going to go to the grave site. But we could easily stay here all day until tonight and come back tomorrow just on two of Delaney's speeches. Yes. That's why I brought a book, which I think many people have, but if you don't have it, uh, this is Robert Levine, uh, again, who has uh, written, he hasn't written anything, who has compiled Martin Delaney's words. Martin R. Delaney, a documentary reader. This is probably the single best compendium of much of Delaney's uh, scholarship, his correspondence. It's best to get all the correspondence. You know, Larry has that stuff, the individual books. It's best to get Blake or the Huts of America, but he has two chapters of it here. It's best to get the correspondence, but he's collected a lot of it here. And as you read Delaney, you realize this is what our people are missing. Mm -hmm. uh, we were talking yesterday uh, at dinner, went to the White House on Tuesday. And that's no big deal. I'm mentioning it for this reason in the age of illiteracy. Sitting there, they have remade the, uh, the novel Roots. And in remaking this novel, uh, they're all excited about it being more historically accurate and all this kind of stuff. So they showed the first episode of it at the White House on Tuesday. 
The only reason they asked me to go down there is because when they screened it at Howard, they asked me to bring some students to participate, and I was on the panel talking back after this the, the first episode. So I said, yeah, I'll come down there. Watching how this narrative has been combined was both inspirational and disappointing. Because you realize that our young people will watch this, and not just our young people, will watch it and go away saying, I know enough now mm -hmm. to go forward. And these books will remain closed. And as these books remain closed, so too are our capacity to think beyond what we can do. Yes. There are some master teachers in this audience, master teachers who have taught me, who have taught for generations, and there are some young people who will be master teachers. We owe it to ourselves to study Martin Delaney in an age of uh, illiteracy. Yes. Because as is evident even from this exhibit here in this museum, black lives continue not to matter to the set the state. Yes. Black lives will never matter as long as we beg for our humanity. And as a remark to a young brother who has become uh, universally known as a consequence of social media, a young brother named uh, DeRay Pearson. Who uh, y'all see him? He got the blue vest on. He's on Twitter and Snapchat and Facebook. And if you don't know who I'm talking about, you see the wide divide between those of us who are trying to preserve the memory and extend it, and the vast majority of our people who get whatever they think they know about reality from social media. Who yeah. <laughs> held sway over the audience at the White House, which included Valerie Jarrett and LeVar Burton and all the people who were in the new movie and all these other, you know, officials, by talking about quote unquote staying woke. What does it mean to stay woke? And what, at some point, an elder put her hands up and said, I don't understand what that means. Mm -hmm. I went to Morgan State University in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. And I know what black power means. I know what black conscious and being conscious means. Is that what stay woke means? Mm -hmm. The answer was yes. And I thought, I'm not going to say a word. Because that's, <laughs> that's absolutely not true. <laughs> Tell anybody from this region that that is not true. It is what these young people are fumbling toward in the dark. Mm -hmm. Not the darkness, but in the dark. Mm -hmm. Without institutionally grounded study. Mm -hmm. That's what we have to do. So I'm looking forward. I wrote a lot more, but we'll have to get y'all to get the compass for that. That's the ad for the compass. And his sister publications like the Comedic Voice, which has talked about Delaney many years before and will continue to do that work. But I'm going to sit down now because we're going to go see Delaney himself. And before we do, see he and his wife, Catherine, and the children, we're going to hear from two more very powerful scholars who are going to lead us deeper into thinking about Delaney. And I'm just glad to be here in community with everybody this afternoon. Thank you.